Hello, it's October 12th, CES meeting for 2022. Uh, we have guests this week uh, from Google, and uh, I'd, uh, I'll call upon Sarah Heimlich to introduce you folks. Thank you. Hi, everyone. My name is Sarah. I'm the product manager for ArcJS, which is the project at Google we're going to be talking about today. Uh, so we may go around real quick and just introduce all of ourselves. So I'll hand it off to Bernie. Hi, I'm uh, Bernie. I'm a PM, um, and I've been working on this project um, for a while, part of a larger area of approvable privacy that you will hear a lot about in this, uh, in this talk. Uh, Maria? Uh, hi, sorry. Uh, I'm Maria. I'm an uh, engineer on RTJS. Uh, next is Walter. Uh, I'm Walter Corman. I'm a tech lead and manager for ArcGIS based in the Google San Francisco office. Ray? Uh, hi, my name is Ray Cromwell. Uh, I'm an engineer primarily working on um, ArcGIS uh, right now. Uh, Sarah? Hi, I'm another PM. I work with Sarah and Bernie. Um, there's two of us Sarah's working on provable privacy, which is sometimes confusing. Um, but I work on an adjacent team, so interested to hear a little bit more about how you all are working. Scott? Yeah, hi, I'm Scott Miles. I'm the tech lead on ArcGIS. I basically architected the, the implementation we're using. And last but not least, Google. Hey, I'm Gogol Balakrishnan. So I am the tech lead for uh, the Raksha project, which actually is used for policy enforcement in Raksha. Yes. All right, so we have a quick presentation. Uh, well, we'll see how quick it is. We have a presentation for all of you today, and then we're hoping to have um, some discussion. So we're going to go over th some stuff and show a demo as well. All right, can everyone see my screen? Perfect. All right. So as I said, uh, our team name is ArcJS, because we have the JavaScript implementation. Um, but you might have also heard this called Policy Protected Data Access for Untrusted Components, which is the name of our WICG proposal. So. All right, so what's our overall goal? So you ha heard both Bernie and Sarah mention uh, provable privacy, which is the broader group that we are a part of at Google. Um, and our whole goal is to have privacy preservation on the open web. So instead of, and one of our big principles is user sovereignty. So instead of a traditional programming model where you have your data, your user data come to the code, we flip that around and instead we have the data, your code go to the user's data. So that way they have sovereignty over that data and the code comes to them. Why is this important? What are problems are there? Well, there's a whole bunch of them out there that we've been looking at how we can help solve with this programming paradigm. There's one of the things we're going to show you a demo of here is a, a picker for fingerprintable data. So in particular, we've been looking at fonts, but we also have a demo for photos. These days, your permission pop-ups, well, first off, there's so many of them. Users often get overwhelmed and just say yes to everything, especially now that we have to say yes to cookies on every website. Um, but they're also overly generic. So when I logged into Zoom here today, Zoom asked for permission to see my camera. And I'm now given Zoom permission for, to my, see my camera for all eternity. So at will, you know, zoom.us can turn on my camera. Um, I've talked about permission pop-up overload already. But also, this gives us the ability to embed and extend web apps. Um, and we'll show more of how this works as we go. So there are three core concepts in our framework, and these are outlined in the WICG proposal, which the link is there if you're interested in viewing it or commenting on it. Um, and there's three components. There are lightweight code components. There's a policy language that governs how they interact with each other and how they can access data. And then finally, there's a UI composition framework that allows you to combine these in different ways so that the user can see. And we go into each of these now in more detail. The key to the lightweight components is that they are executed in a secure environment. And that's what allows us to then do policy language because they can't interact with things unless they've declared it. 
You can also mix and match them. We like to call this choose your own adventure. So in the little example I have here, we have this data, which is your date of birth, and we're calculating your age. But we could also change it so maybe it's going to calculate your birthstone. Those would both be different things, and you can kind of mix and match them in this way. They're also immutable function based, which is really important. And a lot of why we're using this, and we'll be talking a lot more about this, but here's just an example of what a birthstone calculator might look like. When you get an update to the date of birth, it's going to figure out what your gemstone is based on the month you were born. Um, we're going to try very hard to not use these words, but they might slip out. So I wanted to very briefly touch on them. These are what we call them internally um, and in our code and all of those kinds of things. So if you go on GitHub, you'll see these words used a lot. A particle is what we call on these lightweight code components. A store is just where your data is stored. It's fairly easy. But a recipe is a combination of these particles and stores. Normally, you can think of it kind of like a program, right? It's your combination. It's how they're wired together. All right, the policy language. Um, as we've mentioned, we are provable privacy. That's what we're interested in. And the policy language is what lets us do that. It lets you say, hey, some parts of our code are trusted and some parts are untrusted. And we want them all to declare data access and any egress of that data. And we can enforce all of that. The policy language also lets us verify user actions, which we're going to show a demo here in just a minute. And you'll be, and Ray's going to show that. He'll talk through a little bit how we're verifying that those actions are actually occurring and that the code just isn't claiming the user did something. And then the final piece is UI composition. Um, this allows the different particles or code components to delegate rendering. They can either render themselves or they can say, hey, I want to pass this rendering off, let another code component handle it. And it's what allows us to have that user driven experience where things can be mixed and matched because we can compose these experiences on the fly. We can also combine trusted and untrusted components. This is much better understood with an example. Um, so I'm just going to explain the screenshot really quickly and then hand it off to Ray for the actual demo. But you're going to see um, in the demo, you're going to see this, which is a, uh, it's based on Quill, which is an open source document editor. And we've uh, replaced the font picker with our own. So this is actually, the font picker is being run in ArcsJS. It's a, its own code component or a few of them. And so this green box will is safe. That's why it's green. And it's being rendered into the page with this UI composition framework. Um, this is much better understood when you actually see it in action. So I'm going to hand over to Ray and let you share I, your screen, Ray. I, I suspect I missed a crucial world word. I suspect I missed a crucial. Oh, sorry. Um, I suspect I missed. Uh, uh, Go ahead, Mark. I suspect I missed a crucial. Can you hear me? Yeah, I yes. can hear you. Okay. I suspect I missed a crucial word. Uh, it's what does the green represent? The the green represents the portion that's being run in ArcJS. It's one of the code components or particles. Okay. Great. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Uh, let me see if I can share my screen or share my. Ray, I believe you're muted. Uh, one second, I, I'm having Zoom trouble. You guys can hear me now, right? Yeah, you're audible now. Uh, yeah, OK, wait, there's, is there something weird when you share your screen in Zoom? It says it muted my audio because I shared my tab. Uh, you, you need to, um, there's a checkbox that says don't oh, share. Oh, sure. Oh, gotcha. OK, there it is. OK, so you guys can see this, and you can hear me, right? You are audible and visible. OK. <laughs> All right, so the, the challenge here basically is we've got this like uh, Google Docs-like uh, rich text editor. And we want to basically give it access to your native fonts that are installed in your operating system. Uh, and we do not want it to be able to fingerprint your fonts like for advertising purposes. Uh, and so the 
font picker is going to be rendered by some arbitrary untrusted code that's loaded from somewhere on the web. Um, and of course, it could do all kinds of sort of dangerous things if it wanted to. Um, oh, wait, I should highlight something first. You can see the effect. So here I'll, I'll highlight something. I'll bring up the font picker. This is the area in green you saw before. And you can see there's like thousands of fonts here. If I scroll down, it's like every font that's installed on my system. And um, so if I choose, choose that, of course, I can highlight it. Now, the interesting thing here is that, um, so this whole thing is running inside of SES, uh, which we'll describe like exactly like how we're using SES for this later. Uh, but I also bring up the dev tools. This is like a little slide out thing here. Uh, just to show you a little, a little taste, um, you can see that there's a policy tab here. Oh, okay, didn't load that time. Let me do it again. Uh, you can see it says policy is valid. And then here we have sort of like this little, uh, what we call IR, uh, internal representation of the uh, what's happening. And this uses this uh, project Raksha, which basically evaluates this uh, little policy language, which verifies that uh, data can't be uh, properly, uh, data can't be egressed unless you actually click on it. And so the, the key thing here is that um, the, the fonts that are rendered here on the screen, um, basically there's an event handler, like an on-click, and the on-click handler is not permitted to exfiltrate data unless it's the result of a user action, and that's specified in the policy. So if I click on this impact, uh, then it can you know, write data outside the system back to the Quill font editor. However, if I tried to trigger that font click artificially or via just some other just straight up method call, the policy verifier would not permit it. And so you could not egress the data. So that's where like the policy comes in. So I think that's maybe just about it for what I could show in the demo uh, with Sarah. Um, then we can take questions afterwards. You want to mention that the how it's not Franco printable? Or is that uh, really... Oh, yes. Uh, uh, good, good point, Scott. Okay, so the question is, uh, how do we um, how do we prevent fingerprinting? Let me uh, let me go back and share the window for a second. Uh, so you guys can see the uh, you can see the window right. Uh, so when you bring up the uh, font picker and it gets your list of fonts, the way this uh, uh, rendering happens is the fonts are fed to an immutable function, like uh, one at a time. Think of it as like a map reduce. Uh, and so the map, the map function basically can transform each font, uh, whether like the font name, the font weight, the font style, things like that into whatever uh, it wants as an output. And then that is stamped into a template. Uh, and you can kind of think that it, that is like the reduce part of the map reduce. The key point is, is that the map function is like running immutable like SES space and it's it runs the untrusted code, but the reduce part that stamps the template actually uh, is not under the user control. That actually happens as part of the system. And so the, during the actual rendering, there's no untrusted code that sees more than one font at a time. It never, no, no one ever gets to see the entire list of fonts. It can't, they can't create any uh, external mutable states. They can't aggregate uh, between one font and another. So they can't basically accumulate a, a hash. Uh, that yeah, the, I have a question about that. Yeah. Um, so when you say immutable, uh, SES without any further mechanism uh, cannot verify that a function is immutable, but it can ensure that any mutable state it has is confined to that function instance. Uh, is uh, so. Can you explain what you mean by immutable when you talk about immutable functions? Um, yeah, we we have a slide later where we try to describe it. But what what we do is we have a SES compartment where we uh, that's locked down, and the user supplies some code which we then uh, hoist to the top level module scope. The entire uh, scope. Uh, and everything that is reachable from it is hardened. So you can't create anything on global this. You can't, uh, you can't basically, um, you can't mutate anything at the top level. You can't declare any new variables, uh, any you know, new const or let variables in the top level scope. And so the function can only operate on its parameters and return a value. Um, 
if that makes sense. Uh, uh, it's, are you using additional code analysis, so static analysis over the code or transformation over the code in addition to SES? Yes, we do. We, we, okay. we, they, we take the function and we basically kind of repackage it uh, and, and sort of uh, rewrite it a little bit. And so that it's, it, it becomes like a top level function. You can't, okay. you can't create like lambdas that capture, you know, state Got and it. things like that. Yeah. Great. Yes. Uh, SES plus static analysis of transformation can ensure immutability. Great. Thank you. Yes, and, and that's actually kind of one of the reasons we would like we we actually wanted to have this discussion today because we are not 100% sure what we're doing is safe and it would kind of be cool as if there was like a uh, sort of built in sort of add on for SCS or some other kind of like shadow realms or something where we could say hey we'd like this to be an immutable context right. That kind of thing. Great. Even just Mark's statement is yeah. very nice to have just so. It's a Somebody not us can say yes. This is a, a good thing to do. is very helpful. So I appreciate that. So yeah, yes. I, I have a lots lots of thoughts about better support for immutability. And, um, uh, so so this is the beginning of, of, of what could be a very productive um, set of further mechanisms beyond current SES. That makes me feel very warm and fuzzy inside to hear that. <laughs> So on the on that function that you evaluate there, I, I suspect that that's the untrusted code. Is that correct? Uh, that's correct. Yes. So you, someone will have to write a function for this condition. So an author will come and say, "Okay, I want to use this thing. I want to write a function that renders fonts or something like that." Uh, and this is what this function is expecting based on some protocol of some sort. And then knowing that this is going to run inside SES with a compilation step in between uh, to prevent any kind of uh, mutable state uh, that can be used by the function itself, then that function runs in the SES uh, at some point in the future. And, and it runs for each of the funds that the trusted code can identify and the trusted code is just simply given to the library. The library is running in SES to render the piece of it and the output of that operation, what is it? That's the part that I'm not clear about what the output of it is. Uh, the output of the function, you mean? Yeah, the function that is untrusted. Yeah. Um, so I think there's an example on the, the, the slide that Sarah has showing right now in that little gray box on the right. There's a function there called decorator. And this is an example of the function that runs once per every font uh, on your system. And you can see that the input is family, full name, weight, and style. And those are the actual things that Chrome gives you for, uh, for the list of fonts on your system. And what it does is it returns a new uh, object literal and uh, there's a thing called key. There's one called sort key. That's like to control the font sorting. But most importantly, there's a display style uh, attribute that it creates. Uh, you see font family, font weight, and so on. And that's actually used to set a style attribute on the template. Uh, if you look down at the very bottom, you'll see a uh, span sample, and then style is equal to display style. So what happens is, is that this uh, immutable function called decorator creates this extra property called display style, which is basically some CSS. And that's actually stamped into that template there uh, with the sample. And so that's, that's how when you see the font drop down, it actually will say it will actually have the, uh, the font styled its name styled in the actual font itself. So you can see what the font looks like. So you see it says like impact as a sample, that's what that's why it looks like that. Otherwise, it would just be a plain mm -hmm. list of fonts. Uh, so that's that's one example. Now this looks this looks and feels like it's quite uh, it might be too restrictive, but actually we have uh, a lot of apps we could show where this uh, is quite powerful, and you can write quite uh, uh, powerful apps just using immutable functions and uh, transformations like this. Did you say we want to take questions later? I have a question on the bootstrap. Yeah. Uh, so, 
uh, I mean, you can answer it later. Uh, you, you said uh, your the application, the outside application, the editor is uh, untrusted. So how do you initialize CES, uh in or where is CES loaded exactly so that uh, that editor application doesn't cannot compromise uh, CES or uh, or the the primordials uh, so that it can get access to actually what you're trying to hide from it. Um, that's a pretty uh, good question. I kind of know the sort of an answer to it, but maybe Scott can speak about the bootstrap, uh, or at least what the intent yeah. of the bootstrap was. Everything's done in layers because there's no one size fits all. Every customer is different. So some apps are trusted, some aren't. In this case, if you're producing a plugin, uh, it gets tricky. I mean, sorry, this is hard, but Essentially, at some level, what we'll do is make a worker and lock down the worker. Okay. I figured it a, something like that would, uh, uh, would work, but yeah. Yeah, and create a sort of an island to ourselves. Other <laughs> times, we literally lock down the whole, I mean, ideally, what I try to get everybody to do is lock down their app from the very beginning. And then, well, yeah. just in general, because it's a good idea. And I can, so far, we've been able to make this work. My only concern was there's libraries that do bad stuff. Ten, uh, we use TensorFlow. We use a lot of these big, big gnarly libraries that like to mess with prototypes and primordials. But so far, we've been able to make them play nice with CES. And so, again, sorry, yeah, sorry. Sorry, sorry to be all over the place. But like I said, we have a lot of permutations that we support. So uh, go ahead. Yeah. I just wanted to add, since uh, Scott was bringing up trusted and untrusted apps like one use case we didn't put in the slides is um someone um would have a, a website wants to host untrusted code so in this case the web the container is trusted uh, like could be I don't know, figma or something like that uh, salesforce and, and would load untrusted code and, and then things become a lot simpler um because then the entire container is trusted and, all, and you just need to compartmentalize these things. The example here is harder because we want to treat the initial web page as untrusted. And so we need to first create an environment within it and then build all the rest out. Have you done any work to uh, give um, attenuated access to the DOM so that you can give, uh, you can give something effective access to rendering while still uh, preventing it from climbing over the DOM and, and rendering outside the subtree it's given? Uh, yeah, so 100%, this, what looks like HTML templates uh, in the context where CES is, where all the danger is, is uh, virtualized completely. So, I mean, it doesn't even have to be DOM. We can render to sort of any kind of rendering environment. It's just, there's a template and then a model system. So yeah, it's arm's length. So what we do is say, it's, it's just more data output from the particles from this code standpoint. Here's some data. Hopefully you will render this. <laughs> I, I would like you to render this, please. It's kind of always what this untrusted code can do. It makes requests. So yeah, this goes through, uh, a system we have, so we use Shadow DOM. Uh, oh. All the styles are locked down. And then the events that come back are cleansed. We don't send events back, we send eventlets. We just have these little sniblets of data, like this key. There's another play, Ray mentioned this, I don't mean to wax too much, but that we reduce the amount of data coming back so much, I assumed it wouldn't be useful, but it turns out it's actually really useful. <laughs> Uh, so yeah, we're very careful to use DOM similar to how we're using ECMAScript. It's even this just last thing, this use of template is very much on purpose as a platform primitive that once we put this into uh, DOM, these things are inert until we've had a chance to check them. Um, right. Is this, this, is is this work open source? Yes. Yes. Great. I, I I was going to say uh, there's a, I think there's a pretty interesting principle uh, we use at least for the policy to, to, to be able to apply policy to the event system. Um, I, I at least I use this terminology. I don't know if Scott does, but I, I say that the way the event system works is you can only practically be given back what you gave in the first place. So when you set like a let's say an on-click handler on a DOM element, the event that you get back when someone clicks on it 
basically is only data that you gave to the template in the first place. So if you, um, you know, if you want, like when you, when you say like, you know, uh, div like on click equals on font click, you, you give it a value attribute, like value equals impact is the name of the font. And so when you click on the, the, the font and the DOM, what the arcs runtime sends back to this untrusted code is only the value that came out of that mapping function, uh, which is like, let's say the name of the font. Uh, you can't, you, you can't send back some ar other arbitrary piece of like DOM event, uh, like uh, um, some DOM event attribute. So it's you, you get, you get given back what you were, what you gave essentially. And uh, this is, uh, so I suspect that it looks like lit HTML on the template, but it's not quite that, right? So you're doing some, your own template system there to be able to control what, in this case, you pass the key so you can read the key by in the event lab, I suspect. So you're doing- Yeah, I'm sort of a, I'm sort of lit's grandfather. So I, I'm not just me, but my a team and I invented Polymer, which is sort of the precursor to Lit. So the Polymer team evolved into Lit, and I ran off with Bernie to do this this fun stuff instead. So yeah, the, the, I'm only mentioning DNA. A lot of people go, "Wow, this looks kind of like Lit." It's just because yeah, the same. There's there's shared DNA. Yeah, but I, it is it is custom. It's a custom thing we built specifically because, uh, like I said, the template thing I mentioned is really important to me and the JSX style doesn't have that feature of me being yeah. able to st study it as DOM and not as HTML. And sorry, that's pretty drilled in, but anyway, thank you for noticing and I will stop. Yeah, I, I, so, it, so it, it feels to me that, and this is just a side comment. So it feels to me that this has a, a similar problem um, that uh, the similar problem of other systems, including some from Google, where authors has to write the code in a very, very peculiar way. Um, obviously that, that goes against the grain in terms of adoption. Um, people have to understand that they, they really can only do certain things in this, this is a structure that you have in here. Um, now that that's the deal breaker, but it's a very, very big limitation in terms of adoption. Um, so I wonder if you, if, the fact that this is a, the, the, all the information that you can have inside these functions and so on um, is immutable. So there's not really much that you can do there to do a program that has some state statefulness on it. Um, it it's, I, I wonder if it is too restricted. Like have, one have, thing you seen the, the, have you seen the demo apps? Because they're 100% written like this. Sorry, I didn't mean to. I, I, I don't think we've shown stuff. the other. Yeah, we haven't shown the other demos. You should, uh, um, I, but, I, but I think, uh, Karidi, do I pronounce it yep. right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it, you're, you're correct that it's not a non-goal to say any arbitrary code on the web can can be uh, plopped in here and it will just work. I do have to change the style. That said, I, I think it's sort of the long run where I would see this project go is a sort of a layering where this is like a frame, one of the frameworks that sits on top of some basics like SES and the policy enforcement and so on that is shared across different frameworks. And so if people don't like this style, they can go and write another framework um, and, and do that. And so then in, in practice, you will get frameworks that have a lot of constraints relative to the open uh, way of doing things in any way, but, but they are not that different from uh, how modern frameworks tend to look today. Like this sort of functional reactive style that we've seen become very popular recently tends to break things down into very small bits that are often just pure functions. Um, I'll get back to the statefulness in a second. So yeah. that's, how, that's how sort of over a long arc I would see uh, no pun intended. Um, the, this thing evolved where um, um, we, we get the layering right, which we haven't gotten right yet. We're still experimenting with these things uh, and like have really few bits that are, uh, uh, have to be trusted. Uh, right now here, the template language, for example, is trusted. That's like one of the uh, pieces that is trusted, but you could imagine uh, extending DOM standards, uh, web standards, so that the DOM becomes bright only. Like you can only, like the principle that Ray 
spelled out. They can only ever read out of the DOM what you put in, and you can't traverse out of a barrier. You can't uh, read uh, computed style elements. If you had that, for example, you would be a lot more flexible again. Uh, so there's all these kinds of things that we could be doing. We just don't haven't done it. Uh, on the statefulness, the way you we do statefulness is by um, essentially having a self uh, op, a parameter, that, a state parameter that you just return, and then it gets passed to you the next time you call it yourself. So we just make it very ex explicit. And here again, the goal is just to make it explicit in the code, so that we can do explicit uh, policy enforcement and go like, okay, this thing is stateful. It will remember. We have to assume it will remember all its inputs, but that can be fine. Like it's not fine for the scoring function and the decorator here because that would be the fingerprinting. But for many other cases, it's fine. We just need to distinguish it. You could imagine a future version that uh, does more deeper code analysis and just knows this piece of code does that, this does, doesn't do that, and it's, it's a hidden detail. Uh, we just haven't built it that way. So, so, so this, the, the principle is uh, if you layer it sufficiently and have frameworks that impose invariants uh, that are strict, like you can't break them, but hopefully not so bad that you can't express anything, um, you, you should be able to build a, a large class of applications, but you you will have to rewrite your code. Like this is yeah. not a free. Right. No, I, I, Freddie, I, I, I was I was just going to add just to say that like we kind of treat state as a capability in this system, and so depending on the policy, like uh, during decoration when you're mapping over like uh, a font, a non-aggregatable, what we call non-aggregatable data set, like the list of fonts, the the state object is is read only. Uh, the state cap the state capability we pass you but in other contexts like let's say you want to favorite a font or something the user wants to click on something and say like i'm going to mark this as like one of my favorite fonts the state capability you have becomes mutable and you can actually like put into it like oh this is one of the favorited fonts so that like pro that prohibits fingerprinting where you could just accumulate a state you know over the entire thing but if a user is actually clicking on the font you are allowed to mutate the state be the cap the state capability. So it's when we say we, it's we don't allow state. It's basically we don't allow Java arbitrary JavaScript state for, for the language level. But we do have like a state capability uh, that you can acquire uh, depending on the, the the recipe and the policy. Yeah, and no, all that all these resonates well. I think um, I think the the biggest issue is going to be it's very similar to what we, what happened with AMP. From Google as well, like uh, being able to bring existing libraries, like let's say, oh, I want to bring this library that is doing this computational piece of it. How can I do that? And how can I depend on that? Um, I suspect that you don't have a module system here. Do you? Can you do imports here? Can you, what, what kind of interaction can you have between different uh, untrusted pieces, or even between untrusted pieces and trusted pieces? Uh, it becomes very limiting in what they can do. And yeah, they can build a very yeah, but, system, but they have to go all the way in. Uh, yeah, I mean, these are valid concerns for sure. I think some of them are just table stakes. Like you just, you have things that are trusted and things that aren't trusted and you have to deal with it. So we try to manage everything with the budgetary concept. So, and that the other observation that we have is that a lot of the difficult things, the, the high power things. So I think I mentioned TensorFlow, media pipes, WebGL, WebRTC, like these big gnarly things are in a separate layer where they're trusted. So we have to, there is a place where you go, okay, I'm gonna plot up, give you a library of stuff. I'm gonna say, this is trusted. And we usually try to make those things uh, a dependent, you know, stateless, whatever, to improve, make it more likely <laughs> that they're trusted. Uh, but those tend to be leaf nodes. And then what happens is, you know, you only need one WebGL thing. So once that's kind of locked in, where all the novelty and creativity occurs is sort of at this higher level. And we can do that in the particle space. And because it's safe and pluggable and it's hyper modular and all that, the uh, evolution rate is just much higher. So, I mean, I'm, I'm not claiming this is mathematical. This is just sort of emerged what we've seen. But I mean, it's definitely happened in the media states, like image 
guys said, well, we're going to need all these services to do all this stuff. And it turned out, well, they kind of need some com certain convolutions and you can parameterize a lot of this stuff and then build those trusted blocks. And it just becomes power that you can invoke through the uh, safety lens of the policy uh, and these particles to keep the creative part in the untrusted zone. I hope that was cogent. But anyway, I'm not saying we have the answers. I want to just say, yeah, this is really, it's great to have this discussion because we haven't, we've been thinking about these yeah. things too. And I, I was going to say that if, if we had a, um, a much more powerful code, static code analysis and like rewriting system, some of the pain could be removed by transformation. Things like imports might actually be supportable, at least static imports by some transformation, which actually like uh, reassembles them via a recipe system where they're basically like, uh, you know, automatically extracted and put into separate particles or put into, or uh, there's like capability or a service created that's then passed into your particle for use. There might be some transformation that could remove the pain and give you a, like a semi standard looking environment, but that's like kind of speculative. Yeah. For, for imports specifically, I mean, certainly there are certain things you can do with, with transformations that you can't do with CES without transformations. Uh, but for imports specifically, I, um, uh, the, our whole compartment um, uh, system is uh, so that you can provide custom import environments on a per compartment basis. If there's anything that you're doing on remapping imports, that you need transformation for rather than just using the compartment API as is, I would actually be surprised. Right. I, I think that, that, that at least even, even with layer zero of the module handling effort, um, you, you, you take back the control over the import, but that static or dynamic doesn't really matter. You take back the control there and then you can do all, all sorts of things to connect the two pieces that are non-trusted uh, and it's still preserving the, the, the module um, the module system and, and the module uh, capability. So I, I, I think Marcus on the point there, like we, we would like to see, more, or we would like to know more about the, what, are the, what would be the limitations of implementing something that controls the modules, the imports uh, when, when looking at it from the lens of, of the harmony effort. Um, I'd it's say the, the if you haven't looked at, if you haven't, uh, if, if you haven't looked at lava moat yet, uh, it would be, that would be a good thing to look at. Um, we're at a little bit past halftime. The, uh, I'd like to see through to the end of the deck personally. And I think that I, and if we have time after that, I think that we ought to revisit the topic of purity since I think that would be um, uh, functional purity, since I think that would be valuable to this group. Um, so let's uh, let's charge through, if you don't mind. Sounds good. Um, I'm actually going to hand off to Google. So Google, if you just tell me next slide, I will click through for you. Uh, thank you, Sarah. <clears throat> uh, so um, I'll just like take a few minutes, maybe two or three minutes, to kind of explain what we mean by policy enforcement. Um, so before we dive in, uh, when we talk about policy enforcement, if you want to do policy enforcement, these are the four things that you need to have. One is like <clears throat> have an understanding of the data. It could be things like JSONs or like uh, data classes or like the Java classes and stuff like that. And the other thing is like you need to understand how the uh, data is being used. Like what is the what is the behavior of the system in terms of like how is how is the data being accessed, uh, what sort of processing happens and stuff like that. And I think you also need some sort of like data flow analysis uh, to track the properties of interest on the on the on the graph that you've built. Uh, on, on the description of the behavior. And finally, you want to have some sort of like policy that says, okay, what is allowed and what's not allowed. Um, I'll just dive a little bit into all of these things in the, in the, uh, in the coming slides. Um, Sarah, next slide, please. <clears throat> yeah, so when we talk about the behavior, behavior of the system, so it's um, there's generally a need to kind of describe the behavior of the, the interactions of different systems. Like for example, if you think of some simple uh, application. It may not be just one data processing system. It could be like data comes in, you do some sort of map reduce, uh, feed it to something like a SQL query or some sort of like um, uh, image processing pipeline or some sort of TensorFlow graph. And then finally the data gets out. 
So uh, to do any kind of policy enforcement in the sense of like uh, restrict what sort of ac processing or um, accesses happens to the data, you want to be able to describe all these systems. Uh, and that's where um, the notion of IR comes in. Can, can you go to the next slide, please? So, so the idea is like, this is kind of like um, borrowed from compilers. The compilers, you have different la language front ends that actually generate an IR and all the um, comp I mean, optimizations and, uh, and error handling and stuff happens on the IR. So the idea is very similar here. So you have different data processing systems. Uh, if you have a common uh, integrated representation that can be used to describe the behavior of the different systems, then we can actually um, translate the data processing into the common IR and reason about all of them together. So that's how we would actually be able to reason about a system that actually has different data processing pipelines, uh, uh, like the one that I showed in the previous slide. And this is actually a very well-known idea in compilers and following books. So uh, yeah, next slide, please. So here's a snapshot of all the aspects that I talked about. So on the, and here I'm just showing it for how we're doing this for a SQL query. So on the leftmost, uh, left top, we have the SQL query, which is actually the data processing. And then below, we actually have an IR, which if you're familiar with LLVM or MLIR, it, it, it's, a, it's a representation of what's happening. So basically some data is being read, two columns are being read and, and some sort of anonymization is happening. Uh, and finally, we have a description of what is allowed. So basically we're saying you can, you'll allow the egress of the data if uh, it has a differential privacy of some, uh, some, some epsilon, which is ln three. And on the right, you just see the, basically the IR represented as a graph. Uh, and then like the, 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 the annotations like user data and, and not DPR are actually the data for properties that we're actually tracking. So basically what we're tracking is uh, who, who has stake on the data, which is the user data and what sort of properties in terms of differential privacy does it have? So basically you assume that there is no differential privacy to start with. And as the data goes through the system and various processing happens, the, the properties change. For example, if you feed uh, so, uh, the, the something with, without data pri a differential privacy into an anonymized function, it gets a differential privacy. But then if you combine it with something like that doesn't have uh, differential privacy, then the final result is not differentially private. So then we just like, inf we build the IR, the graph, and then do propagation of these properties and then compare uh, and then use the policy to see if, if it's satisfying all the properties that we need. In this case, we want to make sure that the data is differentially private, but that's not what we inferred. So we'll actually not allow this query to run. Can you go to the next is that how, how close is the analogy with LLVM? Is it, is, is it pretty much at the same level of abstraction? Is it a single assignment formalism? It, it is actually a single, single SSA. It's actually SSA form. Uh, but it, it, it doesn't have all the features of LLVM. So LLVM is like, is a much gentle system. So this one, it's inspired by LLVM and something called MLIR, uh, but it's actually a very, very simpler uh, IR. Right. Yeah. Can I go to the next slide, please? Yeah, and here's uh, previous one. Yeah, here's an example where the query passes because the properties that we inferred are uh, satisfy what we wanted, uh, what the policy says. I think that's pretty much it. I'll hand it back yep. to Sarah. Uh, the next set of slides are all on isolation and how we use access. I feel like we might have gone a little bit past this. So um, in the interest of time, I might skip through some of them or go very, very quickly. Um, as Scott mentioned, our goal is to have isolation through depth. And we want to do this by removing side channels. I think we talked about all of these already, but in particular, DOM access, global variables, and prototypes. We do this through mutable functions with SES. We also have an ongoing research area looking into side channels more. And this is how we achieve it. Again, we went into a lot more detail, um, but basically, we have this JavaScript context that spins up a worker that spins up SS compartment. Um, and we treat the uh, trusted code as an object literal. It gets evaluated in that compartment. Um, everything is hoisted to the module scope. Um, and we can have capabilities, which are these service calls that allows us to have invocation at runtime. Do you deny by default, like CES does, the ability to measure duration so that you're not worried about, so that you can prevent side channels through uh, timing attacks? Yes, uh, you're, oh, go ahead, Scott. Right, go ahead. You want to answer that, Ray? Go ahead. Uh, I was just going to mention that, like, you know, we don't, uh, we, we don't give you anything except for our own timeout function. Uh, 
which can be used to run async code, but that's it. But maybe you can go into more detail, Scott. Well, I was just going to say it's a uh, budgetary. So by default, you don't get anything. You don't get random time, any of the impure things. But then we can we allow people to break the rules. OK, great. Here's some examples. The first function is things we don't want to have happen, and we prevent. So things like sending stuff on your prototype, changing global this. Instead, we just want to be able to have these things that you can then return from the function. So the, the values that are returned on the function, um, well, I suspect you just serialize that uh, using the regular worker in, interaction. So you don't do any any massage on top of these. It's just like a, a structured clone of the data that they pro provide. Structured clone, that's right. And so what happened if in these bucket, you have, um, what are, are maybe, maybe you're already disabling few things in SES, like a share a ride buffer or something like that. Do you allow um, interaction like that or it's just disallow? So, I mean, there's intent and then there's like specific. So, and if shared array buffer is allowed through structure clone and it should be, that's just something I missed and we'll just fix it. So our intent is that you can't pass anything but concrete non-cyclical JSON data. Uh, to the degree I've made an error, then, you know, we'll have to work on that. But yeah, the intent is that this is all serializable. Occasionally, I mean, depending on the bus structure, we might serialize it and send it over any bus. So it's structured clone it was sort of de facto the way it works in the worker setup. Uh, but anyway, yeah, it's a long winded way of saying, you should probably tell us more because I may have made a mistake there, but our intent is absolutely to make this super primitive data. Okay. Are you using Harden? Yeah, all over the place. <laughs> okay, great. I'm probably too much. I'm always hardening everything because I'm scared. I'm gonna. That's that's, that's the, the glory of using success is because you guys have plugged so many little holes and leaks and stuff that it gives me it lets me sleep at night. Yep, great, great, and and you're definitely erring in the right direction. If you're you should be be feeling like maybe you're using hardened too much, then you're then you're erring in the right direction. <laughs> So another question on this one, and this is more uh, for the future. So we talk about the timers and, and so on, but more a meta question here, has you done any work on, on or investigating on the shadow realm and how you will be able to maybe use shadow realm um, rather than having to spin out a worker for this and what could be the consequences of that? So, I mean, honestly, the reason we create the worker is just to isolate ourselves from, <laughs> so we can operate in environments we don't control at the top level, but primarily, uh, well, I guess at this point we use the worker also to just have the other thread. So we're off the UI thread because most often we work in browser environments. But I mean, for a long time, we just worked in the main context in essentially a shadow realm. We hardened the main context and create a compartment right there. So we didn't even make a worker for a really long time. It was until we kind of got forced to because <laughs> we had to do something with Angular. Uh, but like I said, it became useful. Sorry, this is a weird conversation again. It's, I want, I would really like to be pure, uh, but we get forced into these compromises. But in any case, we, that's why this isn't a worker right now. If, yeah. But yeah, just on, on that theme, I just want to say, I mean, again, on the weirdness budget, because we are aware that everything we do that's like not, this is not standard, this weirdness budget. Yeah, that's uh, everything area, you saw there is pure, pure JavaScript and pure HTML and platform stuff, web components, shadow DOM, like we to try not to invent anything that we can get straight out of the sauce. Anyway. Yeah, it, it's, as far as this, the actual Shadow Realms uh, spec goes, we actually, um, or at least I did, I looked at it uh, a couple months ago and uh, was looking at using the shim 
Um, and um, <clears throat> it, it didn't have all the features of SCS. Like I believe it did not have like a hardened analog to it. And so I kind of punted uh, at that time uh, and, and just mentally registered that I'd come back to it because it looked like the spec was, or at least the shim was not like kind of like at a production ready uh, uh, level. But I'd be like really happy if like Shadow Realms uh, were also an option that we can plug in because uh, like the whole isolation actual system in ArcGIS is also pluggable. Like we can put in multiple implementations. You can use SCS. We can use Shadow Realms. It's it's just kind of a, a almost like a, a driver that you can plug in. Okay. Uh, no, that, 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 it's just we continue gathering more use cases. So that's why I was asking that question because if it is really not about isolating a different process or 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 even relying on on something like. Uh, Start our clone, which in Shadow Realm, when you communicate with it, you don't have that. It's even more restricted than that because you, you're only allowed to pass basically primitive values around. Um, but if it is not. Our, really our, our intent is to only pass primitive objects around. Yeah. yeah. I, see, I see on this slide with regard to fingerprinting, uh, local compare, locale compare is already, I believe. Um, uh, uh, denied by default, or made or made non-locale specific by default uh, by set by the session. Uh, FP math functions are not. We have not paid any attention to that. What uh, what are the fingerprinting worries with regard to FP math functions? Yeah, this is just something I threw in there because it's just kind of interesting. There's a there's a library called fingerprint.js. You can take a look at it's on GitHub, I think, and um, there are I was looking for like fingerprint vectors, which are not part of, let's say, capabilities the browser is giving you, like t navigator object, you know, references, but like just part of the JS execution environment itself. And one of the uh, surprising ones actually is you can detect which browser you're in, sometimes with browser version you're running in by uh, the differences in the way like the math dot, you know, pal function and math dot sine and cosine return. Uh, things because there there have been subtle differences in those library functions and also because of the JIT compiler JavaScript JIT that's happening uh, differences in the way the FP math would get uh, evaluated and so they've built actual fingerprinting around like you know doing like cosine on some angle and then checking the result against a known thing and say like oh well, I know this is Firefox and not Chrome or I know this is a certain version so it's kind of an interesting it's probably not a practical attack but it's just an example of, of something uh, that. I was I was actually kind of shocked when I saw it. Yeah, I'm I'm glad, very glad to hear it. I mean, I'm shocked as well. Uh, I, I... It, that doesn't sound very deterministic, all that. You might even be able to detect architecture too, like 80-bit if you're on a machine with 64-bit FP versus 80-bit uh, like Intel as extra precision. Um, it's just speculation. Anyway, uh, fingerprint.js on GitHub has some some of these interesting things in it. Uh, if you want to take uh, a look right, at can it. you confirm that the file in chat is correct? Also, uh, we're at three yes. minutes, and and some of us have a hard stop. Yeah, this is our last slide. Uh, I think we kind of already went over it here, basically. So, uh, the very last one actually is uh, these are our email addresses. If you want to get in touch, we would love to uh, talk. Do you have a link to the slides themselves? I will get one uh, in the meeting minutes shortly after this meeting. Excellent. This is fantastic work. I am just so pleased to see this. I think this can be the beginning of a great collaboration between all of us. That's great. I, was, <laughs> I just want to say thank you so much. I mean, we're standing on your shoulders big time and I really appreciate it. And I know I've, I've been following this work for over a decade. So I'm aware of the history <laughs> too of how glacial these kind of standard things are. So really appreciate <laughs> yeah, I, it. I, I started using Kaha a long, long time ago. I think for my kids were Same. born. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. The, 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 that's one of the reasons why I was specifically particularly sensitive with regard to uh, seeing DOM issues, which is uh, Kaha did the, the whole problem so we had Domato as the DOM taming, 
And that was stuck in, in HTML4 days because uh, we, we were just not able to keep up with DOM evolution. And taming the DOM was actually harder than taming JavaScript and was never as reliable as taming JavaScript. Um, and we tried to collaborate at the time, uh, some of the, I suspect Scott will remember, at the time with the Shadow Realm uh, efforts uh, inside Google and the Polymer efforts uh, to try to, to, to have them be a security boundary that could support the security goals of Kaha when we spun out the CES effort into Agoric and we you know, redid it at Agoric, we just gave up on the DOM because Agoric didn't need to, but a lot of Agoric's, you know, a lot of our partners using CES, of course, do need to like MetaMask. Um, uh, so it's wonderful to see uh, uh, the DOM isolation being contributed back in. I mean, that's just awesome. Yeah, certainly this, uh, this is very interesting. That's why I wanted to have you guys around um, presenting here, getting, getting us aware of what you're doing, asking more questions about what exactly uh, are you doing and so on. Because uh, from the use case standpoint, that's important for us to continue gathering more and more because we have all these efforts. Um, now the module system that we want to allow more control on, the compartments API, um, Shadow Realm, obviously, almost there. Uh, we have implementations in all browsers now. Uh, that some of them behind a flag, some of them already there. Some of them are not behind the flag, but they're ready. Um, so we're, we're getting there slowly. But um, I think uh, this is very novel uh, in uh, with regard to how you do it. Uh, we have done some extensive research on other areas, as I mentioned in the previous meeting about uh, the full virtualization of the DOM, putting the restrictions on the virtual environment rather than having to harden the, the I'm bringing mutability into the picture because the restrictions that it, uh, that it imposes on developers. So I think that's another area that uh, would like to, I would like to understand better and see what, so you talk about a lot of capabilities that you can, that you have, that you can pivot and do a lot more things that what you present here. That's the area that I want to explore more, see what else is possible with what you have. Yeah, we need to give them a demo of the node graph, I would guess. Oh, in any case, any of and all of you would be welcome anytime. And also we can schedule to, to cover topics that are relevant to uh, our mutual interests, like, like yeah. getting, uh, at least getting, having uh, someone uh, from having someone from the team like popping in from time from time to time. We do it every week, but we know some people cannot come every week. But it's an hour, and sometimes the topic are relevant, sometimes they are not. But just being aware of what's going on directly, not just by looking at the uh, GitHub repos and what people are talking about out there, but being on the front line here and bringing out uh, use cases and, and raising questions. Yeah, we'd be happy to give uh, cooler demos. Uh, uh, like actually one of the things I would be really interested in the future is uh, picking people's brains over this immutable uh, function stuff and to what extent the SES or Shadow Realms environments could provide sort of like if not out of the box, uh, you know, support for it, they at least evaluate the way we're doing it and make sure we're not doing it in a, in a stupid way. Yeah, that's definitely a question. I, I have that question. Like, uh, how, when you parse the, the function, how do you know that the function can be used, and what are the, what are the kind of um, issues that we can observe there with certain functions? And the, the goal always be, has to be like in, in your case, I think the goal is always. The function has to be immutable, um, but at the same time, you want to allow more and more functions to be able to run inside the system. So how yeah. can you get that balance right? Because it's very restrictive and people have a very hard time to write in a, a function in JavaScript. Yeah, let me, let me, let me um, uh, propose a, a criteria with regard to the, uh, how this interacts with the standard efforts, which is uh, running a full JavaScript parser uh, in the browser uh, is inherently both large and fragile. It's fragile because 
the version of JavaScript running in any particular platform might not be exactly the same as the version of JavaScript that your parser parses. Um, uh, so the criteria I'd like to propose um, is that uh, any time that you have to resort to parsing to achieve the security goal, uh, that should put on our agenda uh, what we should do with regard to proposals for the language so that those security goals can be done without resorting to the parser. Yeah, 100%. I, I, I feel the Agreed. same way. I, I, I always feel a little dirty every time like we resort to mucking with the, the source code. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah but even then we, we don't parse. So we've been careful not to parse. We use some reflection and that's the where we get a little dirty, like Ray is saying. But we definitely don't parse anything. That's like, I've said that three times now, but I'm just, because Mark said well, it, I'm sorry, I know we're over, but I was just, nobody's ever said anything, reinforced this. So it's nice to hear that. Anyway, thank you. Okay, the, the immutability, I thought you were accomplishing by parsing and rewriting. We, well, I'm saying we specifically don't parse, we reflect. So we put it in a place where it's safe and I extract functions with reflection. So I'm not actually trying to like read parentheses and curly braces or whatever, because that's oh, where most of the fragility comes in. Extract the functions using function prototype to string? Uh, yes. Yeah, largely. I see. Very bizarre. Okay. Interesting. That makes yeah, we'll send, sense. we'll send, we'll build, write a doc and send it to you, so you if you don't mind. So you, we'd like to no, please, please. Yeah. 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 But I, I think it's fair to say, Scott, that if you, that you would like not to have to do that if there was like some like uh, like little thing that you could just say, hey, do this and make this function immutable and hoist into the module scope in a, in a secure well, way. I mean, there isn't any <laughs> magic sauce. Mm -hmm. it's, there's a good way yeah. you enshrine yeah. it and then it becomes the way. Yeah. So, yeah. so yeah. we. Yeah, we've been in particular collaborating with Modable, the makers of the XS engine, uh, on things that we want to propose that are direct language support for immutability. Uh, we very much like to, to um, bring you into those discussions. Um, the thing about function prototype to string is that the language spec is quite explicit that an engine might not provide the source code, might decline to provide the source code and in fact, the XS engine, uh, for reasons of uh, memory compactness on, on devices, uh, chooses not to provide source code. So that technique will not work. OK. I mean, in these cases, we would need alternate solutions. But like I said, there's a zillion options. I did this thing literally to avoid having to parse it. So but yeah, anyway, we can. This is a, a great another. Uh, branch we can study. Okay, this is great. Yeah, thank you everyone for coming. Uh, again, we're a little bit over time in the next meeting. They're wondering where we are. Um, <laughs> um, uh, but yeah, again, let's, let's continue this conversation um, whenever you are available. Thank you guys. Yeah, we'll okay. be in touch.